Hello, hello. Hi, welcome everybody. Welcome to what is going to be a webinar and that webinar is going to be about state machines. So today we're going to have a very, very code heavy webinar and I hope you guys are ready. I hope you got some coffee, some tea because it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a little bit code heavy. So for, um, for a moment, I will be showing you exactly what we'll be doing today in this new project I'm opening. And then after that, we're going to go step by step on how to reproduce such things. Now, please do note that in the description down below, you will be able to find two links. One of them is, well, two first links, there's a lot more than that. So um, the first one is about the project files for this very specific project. So if you get lost along the way, or if you want to have a look again at the code that we've done today, um, please go ahead. You can go over there, just open up GitLab and uh, you can either download the whole project or just view those files directly online. Or you also have the option to well, there's also a second link, which is going to be about a more complex state machine that's going to work in 3D. It's actually a project I'm working on the side and it's public for everybody to look at. It's based off this very system we're going to be looking at today. So without speaking more, I'm actually going to show you guys what we're going to be doing today. And this is the wrong one, I believe. Yeah, I'm opening the wrong scene. Um, we're going to be split in three different phases today. So the first phase is all about creating a moving character. It's something that most of you have already done. It's something that, um, you know, it's one of the first thing we do when we start playing around with 2D. Um, so we're gonna be creating everything in a single script. Our character is gonna be going left to right. He's gonna be jumping, he's gonna be falling, he's gonna be doing all these things. Phase number two is gonna be about creating our initial state machine. So we'll try to take our code that we've made in phase number one in a single script and split it in different scripts. So if we have a look over here, it's just the same thing as we saw earlier. Here it has only one script, but over here it has different. It has five script total, which might look a little bit more complex, but it just makes it so it's scalable. So in the future, if you have to change something in the walking behavior, you're not going to be affecting anything else. And now in the third phase, we're actually going to go and improvise a little bit, make a little bit of new states, make anything we want. At that point, we're going to be having, um, we're going to be having a scalable state machine and we can do pretty much anything we want. So for example, I've wanted to add double jump. Now it's only possible to do so um, if I already touched the ground. So if I'm trying to double jump more than once, it's not going to work. It's all being controlled within these very specific script. And there's also another script we've made just for fun called dash. So I can dash in the air, and if I dash, I can't double jump. Now, see, everything is kind of intertwined, but at the same time, it's all split in different scripts, which make it very, very nice. Okay, one more thing I'd like to add is before we go any further, if you download these project files, they will not come with these nice little graphics because I haven't made those. Those are actually something we've grabbed off the asset store, and I invite everybody who wants to have these to visit the asset store. It's actually... Those were free assets, they look pretty good, and they are, I believe they are a preview to a bigger pack. Um, but they're free and I invite you to check them out. Maybe give a rating at the same time if you like it, if you want to encourage people making free stuff on the asset store. I found it over here under the 2D section and it's the first one, so by buy a game, free platform game asset. Okay, so let's get started. Right now in my scene, I want to create something very simple. I want to create movement, simple movement, so left to right movement, and we'll try to put that in a single script, as we as we just mentioned. So we're going to start by just laying down a very, very simple 2D controller. Okay, so to do that, first, I'll set up my scene. I actually don't like having the skybox so much, so I'll shut down that skybox under rendering and settings, and then we'll go with something fresh like this. Now, as we're going to be um, going around, I want to save my scene, say so call it game scene. And I also want to have a platform on which my character will be able to stand on. I'll make sure to create myself, say, a new cube, center it in the middle of the world, and maybe just make it larger like so. Let's put a nice value 15 over here. And we're going to end up with something of the sort. Now, we are going to create ourselves our character. So our character prefab, how could it be made exactly? Um, a practice I like doing when I create something like that is to simply create myself an empty game object, call it player, and this one will contain all the logic, and then beneath it, 
we're gonna have the graphics. The reason I do that is that, so we're, we're putting all the logic, we're building our prefab, we're making it you know, work well, adding the right scripts. And then if we want to change a graphic at one point, we can just change the children be needed. So that's a, a practice I actually like doing quite a lot. So I'll go under my folder I've downloaded. This is the assets from earlier. So these assets. And I'll find myself the character. It's somewhere over here. Or even better. So what we have is we have character animation, which we can use for animations, right? So I'm going to go ahead and start working with those. Now there is two type in this one. There's a 1x and 2x. 2x will stand probably for something a little bit bigger. Yep, so this one's 0.5 MB. It's also bigger in size. So let's actually treat ourselves and use something that's a little bit more high quality. Um, now, as I want to create my player, I'm going to need some graphics. So that's what I'm doing right now. Let's import the character animation idle. As you can see over here, this is actually more than one character. If we drag and drop this, it's actually going to look something like that. That's too big, right? We don't really want this. Instead, um, we're going to assume that this is a sprite sheet and we're going to change our sprite mode to multiple. We can then open the sprite editor and tell our sprite editor to actually do the cutting itself. So I'll go over slide, slice, and we can change that to automatic and do a slice. Now, if you have a close look, it actually slices all of these apart and you can see that they have different names as well then I'll just make sure to hit apply. Essentially, what we've just done is that instead of having just one, we now have up to 12 different little guy. So just for starters, let's go ahead and put this under player. So the first frame is gonna be under player. Okay, awesome. Um, as I've mentioned, this is gonna be the graphics. So the graphics of this object. And over here on the top level is where our logic is going to be. So when I talk about logic, I'm talking about the movement script. I'm talking about any type of colliders that we have. Um, yeah, these kind of things. So let's start with, say, a character controller. And we can make this a little bit more fitting. So maybe 1.5 in height. Yep, that sounds good. And then a movement script. I'll call this one player movement and we're going to breeze through it. So now if you think that this is going to go a little bit too fast, don't worry about it. We're breezing through it simply because um, it's not the final script. It's not a state machine. It's just to get ourselves moving and get ourselves ready. So let's open this up in Visual Studio or whatever you prefer as a code editor. And now under the player movement, we are going to say we need a couple of different things, right? So what do we need to move our player around? Well, first, we'll need a character controller. We are going to need a couple of different floats. Um, we can make them either public or we can make them serialized private. I like to use serialized private a little bit more. So private float jump force. I like to put that on something like seven. Again, serialized field gravity and let's maybe just add speed in there as well private float speed with these three value we're going to be able to start moving our character around and we'll do that in the update loop okay thus far nothing too complicated you guys probably know what I'm doing with this I'm just gonna quickly grab myself a reference to our character controller. All right. So first thing we'll do, how do we move our character around? Well, we're gonna need some type of input from the player. We're gonna need some type of input from the, uh, the, the actual human behind the computer. And for that, I'll create myself an actual uh, function that will return myself a, a vector tree that contains my input. Okay, so in here, this is just to read the inputs from the keyboard. And to do so, I'm going to start declaring myself, say, float x, which will be input get axis, and we're getting the horizontal axis. Horizontal, you guys know it, it's about 
A and D on the keyboard, but also left arrow key and right arrow key. And we'll do the same thing for Y as well. Even though we're using a 2D game, I'd like to get the Y axis in case I want to use W or up arrow key for jumping. And then I'll make sure to return this as a new vector 3, because that's what I said it was. We're going to say X, Y, and then 0. Vector 3 also has an overload in which it only takes two value, so technically you could just do that if you wanted. Okay, we've got our input. I'll declare it up here and I'll make sure to grab these inputs. You could have also put it at the top there, it's really up to you. In that case, I like to just <laughs> squeeze that in here in case I want to use different type of inputs or I want to do something fancy, like maybe, maybe here I would like to do um, a normalize. So up to you in that case but actually we're not going to be doing that because that's really just for 3d um, we don't get that problem here where we move a little bit too fast into axis okay so we've got our input now the the closest thing we can do to moving is this we can say hey move using your input right and we do something like um, dot times the delta time in order that in order so if our computer runs faster, we don't necessarily go faster, we go with the real time. And then we'd have a behavior in which we can move. Nothing complicated. Everybody over here should be able to do that. Let's just make sure everything compiles and everything works. So I'm going up, right, down, left. Okay, we've got a start. <laughs> Definitely not the end, but we've got a start. So what do we have to do here? We grab the input and we move the player. But in between these two, there's a couple of different steps. First, I'd like to actually apply um, these input some speed. So I'm actually going to create myself a new vector tree, and I'll call this one move delta. And we'll start with say vector three dot zero. Now, my move delta, what it's going to be, um, since I don't necessarily want to move with my input 100%, I want to move with a modification of those input, I've created myself a, um, a vector tree called move delta, and this is exactly the movement you will do in between the previous frame and this frame. So everything we do for the move delta will be applied to our controller over here, so I've made sure to replace that by input. Okay, so We've got our move delta. Now I'd like to know um, what can we do to this move delta. Well, first we want to go left and right, right? So move delta dot x could be equal to our input dot x. But then we also have a speed, so let's do time speed, and we should be good to go. Now we have a movement left and right. It's being blocked by colliders. However, what we don't have is gravity. So to implement gravity, here's what I'll be doing. I'll create myself a new float that I forgot at the top. Private float vertical velocity. And the reason I like to keep one in, um, keep this one in a different field, um, it's because we're gonna need it. We're gonna eat, we're gonna need its previous value in this very specific frame. So we'll go ahead and we'll say our gravity has to change. Our vertical velocity has to change based on the gravity. Um, but this also changes based on are we on the ground or are we not on the ground. If we are on the ground, our vertical velocity should always be stable. It should be equal to minus gravity. But if we are not on the ground, our vertical velocity should increase. It should go faster because we're falling right now, we're gaining speed. So that's why over here, I'll say, if my controller, if it's grounded, then if it's grounded, my vertical velocity is going to be something to like minus gravity, that will do the job. But if it's not, I'm going to decrease it every frame with a minus equal this time. Okay, now with this in mind, I should be able to say move delta dot y is equal to vertical velocity. Okay, so now with this code, if we have a quick glance at it, we should be able to move left and right with the speed. And then if we're not grounded, we're going to be equal to one specific value. It's not going to be that fast. But if we are not grounded, we're going to keep gaining speed every frame. What we're missing over here is simply a jump. So 
Let's assume that we're pressing spacebar while we are grounded. At this point, I can say my, ver my vertical velocity could be equal to jump force. Okay. And just like that, I think we're done. We've created ourselves our script. Contains all values from above. And we can test it out. So I'm going left, right, I can jump, and as I jump, I go up, and then I lose velocity as I go up. And if I keep on going, you're going to see that I gain speed very fast. Now we could do something else over here. We could also add a clamp to that. We could add a clamp to our velocity by creating ourselves a terminal velocity, which is something that we'll do um, with a state machine. Right now, I just want you to have a look at this and say, okay, so we've got this. But now in my game, I'd like to have a horseback riding. Well, where do you put it? Do you put it in here when you're grounded? Or what if you actually catch your horse mid-flight? Do you put it there? How do you actually follow, like how do you actually parse that? How do you actually modify this move delta? Do you just put a bunch of code over here and say if horse then you just start over again. You just have a new if condition. No, that's just too much work. That's just too much work and it's going to be way too hard to reread yourself after that. So this is where the state machine comes in. And the state machine is a very, very powerful tool because it will allow you to split your behavior in different C-sharp classes. What does that mean? So let's assume that you're playing your favorite RPG right now. You're playing your favorite RPG and you're getting to a very awesome, hard boss fight. As you get into the boss fight, it's only you with your sword and then the boss walks in the, um, the premise, he walks in the room and he starts attacking you with his sword. He's on foot as well. But then at one point, you deal a critical damage to him and now he's entering phase two of his boss fight. And now he summons his horse, he has his horse and he's fighting you, he's super fast, and maybe he's um, shooting a bow, an arrow at you while he's on a horse. So it's a whole new behavior that has nothing to do with him walking on foot and hack and slashing you. So now, with these two different behavior, and say maybe you have a third one where you do a critical hit again on him and now he's entering the final stage of the boss, it's like he's in rage right now. Maybe he has his enraged stat state where he goes back on foot and now he runs extremely fast and he does will win with his sword. He like spins around and do a lot of damage. So you have three different behavior over here. How do you choose which one to execute? Well, that boss could have a brain behind him. We can't, we're going to call it a brain today. I like to call it motor in this case because we're doing something that's movement related. But assuming that that boss, that AI, has a brain and then depending on which state he's in, he's going to play one of the three behavior we just talked about. So if the boss, like if it's the, the beginning of the fight, he's going to play his first behavior. So he won't even be aware that he has two other behavior just yet. He won't even know they exist. He's just going to run one piece of code that says, hey, you're on foot, hack and slash, go slow. You know, everything is easy. No, no fast pace at this time. And then as soon as this is over, he will forget about this one and will, he will jump onto the horseback riding phase. So that's a little bit how you're going to see um, us implementing our state machine in a moment. So what we're going to be doing is first we're going to start, we're going to tell our state machine, hey, you're on foot right now, you're walking. And then depending on what happens, it could be input, it could be environment stuff. So um, for example, we could be starting as a walking, a walking animation, walking behavior. And then without any input from the player, suddenly the floor collapse and now you're in a falling state. We can be checking for that while we're walking. So we're going to check, okay, still, is there still a floor beneath me? If there is not, go inside of a falling state. Okay, that was a lot of talking. <laughs> Let's go ahead and implement this. It's a whole new story to implement. So I'll go under my script folder and I'll create myself um, just to make sure I. I I don't mess up things and I don't overcomplicate things. I'm going to create myself a new folder. In this folder, I will create another folder called Mota and another folder called States. And now it's time for us to create the brain 
for our player. Our player is going to have a specific brain that will go through parsing all of these things. It's no longer going to be the character movement. So I'm going to remove that. And we're going to create ourselves a new player motor. As mentioned, this will be our brain. I'm going to drag and drop it on top of the player. And then beneath my states, I'll create a new C sharp script called base state. Okay, so if you've done a little bit of inheritance, you know that if we call something base, it's probably something that's going to be abstract and we're going to be inheriting from that first. But before I go any further, let's start looking at the brain. So the brain of a state machine needs a couple of things. In this case, it's going to need something to update every frame. So we're going to keep our update loop, this thing over here. So we're keeping our update loop, but it also needs another function called change state in order to change behavior. This one will, stay, uh, will actually take in a base state as a parameter. And that's actually, I believe that's actually all we need for a brain. <laughs> it's not much, but this actually could do the job. Now, depending on what your state machine does, of course, you can have a lot more fields in here. You know, we're going to have our um, character controller in here. We're going to have the active state. So base state, current state. And we could have a couple of different fancy values that multiple states will share. So I will just go ahead and put that down here. Okay. Now, um, where do we start? We're going to start by getting ourselves a couple of reference in the actual style. So we want to have our controller. Let's say get component. Character controller. We could say our current state is going to be equal to Hmm, we don't have any right now, so we can't really put that there just yet. But we could do something like uh, get component type of state walk. State underscore walk. But it will not be relevant just yet because we don't have that state. Okay, so I'm quickly going to open our previous script so we can have a nice side to side comparison of what we'll be doing. Let me go ahead and just open this one as well. Put this on the side. And let's have a look. What do we have over here? We have these fields. This is related to jumping. Okay, um, we could put that, say, in the jump state later. This is related to gravity. This might be important because multiple states will be using gravity. So here's what I'll do. I'll go at the top here and say public float gravity. I'll make this one public for the simple reason that other scripts will be accessing it. I don't need to make it private. I don't need to make it serializable because it's public. Um, therefore, I will be able to edit this directly within the inspector. Um, if we wanted to be a little bit more safe, what we could have done is just create ourselves a property instead and return a private value. What else could we do? Well, we already get that, okay. Oh, grab the input. That's something that's quite important. So let's go ahead and grab those inputs. We'll just copy this over as well. Okay, so right now we're grabbing the input and that's fine. Defining our move delta. Um, that is also important, so let's go ahead and do it. Now, move delta.x is equal to input.x. Okay, so this is very specific to a walking state. Therefore, I will not be including this. Controller is grounded. Um, vertical velocity, okay, that's again very, very specific to different states. So if we are um, using a plane, if we're on a flying state and we're like mimicking the behavior of a plane, we don't want this to be running. So that's again, very specific to that behavior. We don't want this, don't want this. Move delta is equal to vertical velocity. This is actually something we'll want. So I'll explain to you why we'll want to have something of the sort. It's actually because vertical velocity um, will be modified by our classes. So assuming we have a jump 
jumping class. Every single frame in that update, I will be modifying the vertical velocity and then we'll be setting it back on the move delta over here, outside of that state. So I'm gonna need, I'm gonna need myself a float vertical velocity. And then finally, the most important part is where we actually move our player. Okay, so if we are to run this right now, what's going to happen is nothing. <laughs> We're going to move by move delta dot zero, and um, you know it's not going to do anything. And also, a vertical velocity never changes, therefore nothing will happen. We're still going to be running the loop, however, no movement is there to be found, and that's because our movement is going to be happening over here. Ask our state to define our movement this frame. And this is where all the magic happens. Because we're going to be asking whatever state we're in. So we're going to be asking to our walking state, what should we do this frame? Oh, by the way, here is my input. Hey, jumping state, how should we move this frame? By the way, here's my input. Um, falling state, how do we move? Dash, how do we move? Here are my inputs. So we are at that point where well, we have to define a couple of states. And we're gonna start with the simplest one. Um, the simplest one could be walking. So let's go ahead and open the base state, see what we can do with this thing. Okay, so we got ourselves a brain. Let's not forget, we got ourselves a brain. Now we need to have the behavior beneath that brain. But right now, we are under base state. We're not under walking state. We're not under jumping state. We need to have some kind of, I want to say interface, but it's not going to be an interface in that case. It's going to be something that all the states can do. So every time I see something that inherits from base state, whether it's walking, whether it's jumping, I want that object, whatever it is, to be able to do one thing public virtual, or let's do protected in this case, protected virtual void process motion. It can take in our input. Every single state, I want them to be able to process motion. Now process motion is what I was talking about over here. So I wanna say move delta, mm, should I do it this way? Yeah, actually, let's change that to a vector three here. So move delta is gonna be equal to whatever state we're in, if it's jumping, if it's walking, and it's gonna be equal to process motion. So process motion, like so. Now, instead of process motion, we were also sending ourselves the input. So we'll be sending the inputs over here. And this should now work. Okay. Um, inaccessible because of its protection level. Okay, let's see. Oh yeah, this one's probably my bad. And we'll just define it a, um, a value just for the moment. So let's do return. We could do return input. So if we haven't defined anything, it's just going to return the input of our keyboard. And therefore, we'll see movement. It's just going to be very, very slow. And um, yeah. OK. So that's one of the things that I'd like all my states to be able to do. I'd like them to be able to tell me, where should I be this frame? That's the base of our mechanic. That's the whole reason why this state machine exists in the first place. So that's the most important one. But then on top of that, because we have such a design in place, we can also put some key points in here that we can call from pretty much anywhere. Like this one. Oops. Construct, we could do also destruct and one final one that's gonna be very very important transition now I want you to imagine that every single states are going to have walking jumping horseback riding uh, plane <laughs> all of them are gonna have these four function or they could have these four function one of them is gonna be called construct so Every time we enter that state, every time we fall into that state, if 
if we're currently falling and we finally hit the floor, as soon as we hit the floor, we're going to be changing our state to walking. And then walking is going to be calling its own construct method. When we exit from that walking state, we are going to destroy this walking method. This, sorry, this, we're going to call destruct on the walking state. And then every single frame while we're walking, I want to be looking for which state can I go from here. So if I'm walking, I can't just start, for example, oh no, even better. Okay, so if I'm falling right now, I can't start jumping again. I'm falling. I don't have any foot on the ground. I don't have double jump in that game. I can't start jumping if I am falling right now. So it's very important that we define our transition very well. So I'll give you an example. You'll see the implementation in a second. But as we go through transition, um, I want you guys to remember that this is the branch. So if you're in a certain state, you can only branch to the one defined in transition. So I don't need to put anything in here at the moment. Those are all virtual and they're going to be empty by default. Now, to give you a proper implementation so you can have a better idea, we're going to go ahead and create ourselves a state underscore underscore walking. Or I think we call it walk. Okay, it's going to be walking and we'll just change that over here. Awesome. Now we get a problem over here because um, it's not referred as a base state, which we'll change in a second. So as I open up my walking state, I want to make sure this one inherits from base state. Therefore, all the code that we've made within base state is now defined over here. Now all we have to do is overwrite. Okay, right, so overwriting is quite simple. Um, we're going to start over here by defining something that's very specific to this walking state. We could say run speed. We didn't have run speed earlier. We actually don't have any speed value over here. So what we're going to do is this thing. We are going to override the process motions. That, that's the only thing we're interested in. Oh, you know what? Actually, to give you a very good example of what's happening with the base state, why don't we just boot this up and see what happens? I haven't overridden anything yet, so the behavior we're going to be seeing is the behavior from a base state. Oh, we got a no reference. That's because we don't have the walking state over here. So state walking. Let's hit play again. So it seems like we still have a small issue. So let's go find out. We don't have a character controller. Actually, we do have a character controller. Hmm. get component character controller okay should be here let's um let's find out what's what's the other problem then current state does not exist okay so everything seems to be set up properly let me try again. So it says on top of this very specific object. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a bit my bad. So here. Small typo as I'm live happens sometimes. There we go. And then the other problem was here because since we crashed on this line, we couldn't get to that line and that line had a reference, no reference over here. Okay. Now, as we play this, this is going to be the base behavior. We can go left, we can go right. It's extremely slow, as you guys probably notice. Even though I have like run speed on five, it doesn't matter. This value is not hooked in anywhere. And also, it's good to know that it's not falling. So obviously, something is wrong over here. Well, actually, nothing is wrong. We're just calling this over here. This is the function that's being called. Now, as I'm walking, as I'm no longer in a base state, I'd like to overwrite this and change its behavior. How do we do so? Like this. Protected, override, and we're overwriting 
the process motion. So it's a vector three oops. process motion. Or did I put it on public? Yeah, it's public. That's why I don't get autocomplete. <laughs> there it is. Um, and this is what happens. Here, instead of just returning input, we're going to return input times run speed. Extremely, extremely simple. Okay, let's try this out. Nice, now we're actually running. We're actually, we're in a walking state and we're actually going faster based on our run speed. And what's really interesting over here is that our run speed value is not stuck within our player motor. It's actually somewhere else. Another state keeps, um, keeps track of its own scope. Okay. All right, but walking state is a little bit more complicated than that, right? So it's a little bit more than that. We'd like to maybe do something like this, right? Input. Let's do, hmm. We're going to do input.x is going to be equal to run speed times nothing. We can just keep it that way, actually. <laughs> and then we'll, we're going to put a very small amount of gravity on top of this. So input, actually, sorry. I was about to say input.y is equal to minus gravity, but then I realized that uh, we're not modifying the y-axis directly. We're actually modifying um, the vertical velocity, which brings me to one thing I forgot. It's probably because I'm live <laughs> and a little bit, uh, a little bit under pressure. Um, I forgot to do one thing. It's going to be very important for the state to know about its brain. Um, and the reason being is that the brain is going to contain multiple information that you might want to have as a state, such as, are you grounded right now? Or um, if you have a value you're sharing, like vertical velocity, like what is that value? So for that, I want to include the player motor in here. And I'll make sure to make it protected so the children of this class can access it. And then over here in the private void awake, we're going to say motor is equal to get component type of player motor for the sole purpose of having a reference to that. And do note that this is in the awake, so you know it's a one reference you get at the beginning. It's not expensive, and it's usually happening during a loading screen. Okay, so back on our state, now we have access to motor. We can say, hey, our you know our vertical velocity um, is it's cool, it's cool, but we could have it. to minus gravity, so motor.gravity, just like we've done earlier. So it's gonna be equal to minus gravity. And um, yeah, that's all we need. Now, for some reason, vertical velocity is not public. I'll probably put that on private. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so let's put that on public. There it is, and maybe maybe uh, minus, gra like, minus gravity is way too strong you could put it on something like minus one instead. So basically the whole purpose of this is to make sure that we're sticking to the floor no matter what. So we could do the times of delta time here. But even that wouldn't make so much sense. So you could do just minus one. Um, technically you're on the floor and you should not have any vertical velocity. It should be like on zero because you're not moving. But what I'm forcing here is I'm forcing movement towards um, the down axis just so we we're actually sticking to the ground oh and also something that's good noting is we could have also overwritten the construct so public override construct and actually set that over here so we could have said hey we've just hit the floor whatever velocity you had before that just put it on zero okay but we're also doing it here so it doesn't make much sense to do so We'll come back to construct in a moment, however. All right, so it's a little bit complex. Huh? It's a little bit of, uh, <laughs> it looks like very complex stuff at the beginning, but once you get the hang of it, it gets very, very cool. Now, if we just run this real quick, I just want to make sure that I recall velocity brings me down. Oh, again, what's this? I get the same problem as above. I don't know why I write it this way. There it is. We 
should be able to go left to right and then there's a small velocity that's going to be applied and that small velocity is pushing my player in that very specific direction and he's now gone <laughs> all right good so that's kind of what we want however you know we're walking right now it should not eh, it shouldn't really go down so much we should be entering a falling state is what i'm trying to say and that's where we have to look into okay how do we change state well only the walking state will know which state we can go in from that point on so we can do that through transition public override transition and we'll just say right here if you're not if you're not grounded anymore so if motor grounded hmm Okay, motor right now is player motor. It does not contain the character controller. So we'll need to create a reference to that very, very quickly. Or even better than that, we can say private bool is grounded. And screw that, it's going to be public actually. So we can call it from our state. We can go over here and say, hey, is grounded is going to be equal to motor. Or in this case, controller is grounded. So we can only call it once here and we don't have to call this function more than once. We can keep this value in, um, in the scope. This is also very nice if you're going to be creating your own grounded function. Uh, usually your own grounded function is going to have a lot of fray cast in it. You just want to be running this once per frame. So let's just, are we on the floor? Store it locally so everybody can access it this frame. All right, so back over here, I'm, I can say now base molder is grounded. If we are not grounded, we can go ahead and say, hey, okay, we're not grounded, change my state and make it something different. Make it something like state underscore falling. Ah, here we go. Now we're starting to see a little bit what's happening. Um, obviously, a couple of problem here is we don't have a state falling and we're not calling transition just yet. So let's go ahead and fix these two issues. I'm going to start by creating a new state. Call it state underscore falling. I'll quickly open it up just to make sure I have compiling code. I'll make it inherit from base state. I won't bother filling in what's in it just yet. And I'll go in the player motor because there's one more thing that we've done earlier. Okay, we're just done moving right now. Let's check. Let's check if we have to change state right now. We can do so by grabbing our current state and calling transition. Transition will take care of looking at... Okay, can we... Um, should we move right now? Are we good or do we have to change state? This is also going to be in the update. It's very important that we have a look at this every single update loop, which means that now this is behaving just like an update. And also, this is also behaving just like an update because process motion is being called within the same exact update loop. This is done before though, and this is done a little bit later during that update loop. And this code calls change state. Okay, final piece to our puzzle, change state. What happens in here? Well, okay, so we're going from walking to falling, which means um, walking should be my current state. I can say, hey, this is walking right now. Let's destroy, let's do a destruct on that state. We are no longer walking. Then we can say, oh, actually I messed that up, sorry. This is our current state, there you go. And then our current state, once it's destroyed, once walking has been destroyed, we're going to say, okay, well, walking is going to be equal to falling. This is the one we receive in parameter. That's the new one. And with that new one, we can say current state construct, just like so. And now we've got all we need to create ourselves a state machine. It's really just, it's that simple. So we have the change state. Make sure to kill the old one, replace it, call the construct, and as we're changing this reference, as we're changing current state, we're also changing which process motion it's looking at, and we're also changing which transition it's looking at. Which means, if we wrap this up, 
we go over here, press play, it compiles. This is what we get right now. We should be, oh, <laughs> we get an error. We get an error on change state. And that is probably because it's actually not thinking we're on the ground on the first frame. That's exactly why. So as the engine believes that we're not on the floor at the first frame, maybe because we're not close enough or maybe because it's a required thing to do at the beginning, um, the is grounded function from character controller sometimes doesn't work just fine. Uh, but what happens here is that it's trying to call the change state. And in that change state, it's using a state it doesn't have. So it doesn't have falling over here. So as I put this on, what we're then going to realize is that, okay, um, we don't have the behavior of walking anymore because it thinks we're falling right now. So as I'm going left and right, I'm going extremely slowly. Now you guys probably know why. And it's because I'm not using any behavior in falling. So the reason I'm going extremely slowly is because I'm using the base state behavior. We're actually just running this code and that's why it's so slow. So before we see any real change, let's go ahead and create this. It's gonna be very, very simple. Okay, so we have public. We can override the process motion only. Let's do that very, very, very fast. What happens when we're falling? Um, maybe we wanna still be able to move left and right. Maybe we still wanna have that. So I'm gonna go ahead and say, <clears throat> maybe not public, serialized field. This is what happens when, it, when we're moving. We have air velocity. We can say, okay, instead of going at five in speed, we can go a little bit slower, so maybe three. We're gonna go at three of speed, and, and I think we're good, yeah. So let's do, okay, our input. Um, hmm. Now, which direction are we going in? We can we can know which direction we're going in by using this input. So we can say input that x is going to be equal to air velocity. So if it's minus one, we are going to go at let's do times equal. Um, if it's minus one, we're going to go at minus three. If it's one, we're going to go at three. Simple stuff. But then, since we're falling, it's a lot more than just going left and right at a slower speed. It's also having different vertical velocity. So this is where we're gonna be modifying that. So vertical velocity is gonna be equal to minus gravity. Okay, so let's go through this again. Your Y input doesn't matter. So if you're pressing on W or S, doesn't matter. We only care about are you going left and right? And if you are going left and right, you're gonna go there much slower than if you were on the ground. So at three speed instead of five. At the same time, in the same frame, we're gonna say, hey, you know that vertical velocity? Let's uh, just decrease it every single frame. We don't need to, no, we don't need to make it uh, more, more complicated than that. All we have to do is this. So these two lines of code in our return should be enough to have ourselves a very simple falling state. So let's go ahead and try this one out. I'm just gonna lift my play over here and then you're gonna realize that something is wrong. Yeah, okay, we are falling, that's totally fine. However, we technically keep on falling. So if you imagine the number that are going on in the background over here, actually you don't even have to imagine, they're right here, right? So vertical velocity is going up very, very fast and that's because, well, first, we're not clamping our velocity. So we still, you know, we're not looking at the terminal velocity, we're just going down, 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 down. And if we are just to slightly move off the edge, if we have no more collider blocking us, like if we don't have this anymore, that speed just carried on and we went down so very quickly. So um, that's not good. So let's fix both of these issue right now. We could say first, serialize field, private float terminal velocity which I don't know what the right number is. It's around this, I think it's around 24. <laughs> it's a little bit more complex. I think it's 21 point something, 21.4, not 100% sure. Um, and then we can say, hey, if that velocity goes beneath that, so if vertical velocity goes beneath minus terminal velocity, let's just go ahead and clamp it up, right? Like so. That fix one of our problem. The second problem is that, well, Technically, we hit the floor at one point. We shouldn't be on the floor. So how do we go about fixing this? Exactly the same way as we've done with the other transition. 
we can just go down here and say, hey, are you grounded? Yeah, you're grounded? Okay, well, then go ahead and change, right? You're grounded, you don't need to be in that state. You can be in a different state, like walking, for example. So state on the school. Walking. There we go. And just, just like this, we've made our loop in between falling and walking. We should have had everything ready, and to prove it, let's create ourselves a couple of different platforms, like so. Maybe just take that camera a little bit further, so something like this. And now as I hit play, I want to be having a look at my... Oh, actually there's a problem over here. I'm not even pressing anything and it's going in one direction. Oh, this is interesting. Um, but as you could, as you probably could see, it's only going right when I'm touching the floor. So technically, it's only happening when I'm in the walking state. So there's a bug in our walking state, and I want to see what it is. Over here, I say input x is equal to run speed. What I should be saying, it's times equal to run speed. We're multiplying our current input with the speed of our run. We're not assigning it directly on 5 which is also why I couldn't go left because every time that I had minus one as input it just said hey we don't care it's actually it's actually gonna be five okay so here's our guy at the top here just to show you the difference I'm gonna make this very very fast so 15 so we're going very very fast but if I fall then I have a little bit of leeway I can still move left and right but it's gonna be very 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 um, slow so let's have a look at this I'm just gonna hold A and as we enter falling state, we just go so slow. And right there, we, we are swapping in between walking and falling state. So this is already amazing. We already got a state machine working with two different states. But let's go and take that to another level. It's not completely replacing the behavior we had prior. So we want to be adding a jump in here. How do we do so? Well, same as above. So create. We're going to create ourselves a jumping state. So state on the score jumping. We're gonna make sure it inherits from base state. And now what do we have to override? So hmm. Okay. Well process motion is always something we have to override. We still wanna have air velocity. I still wanna move a little bit slower. We won't need to do terminal velocity because if we, we can't really jump like we're not gonna go in negative if we're jumping we're going up right we're not going down we're not losing uh, we're not having incrementing gravity every frame actually we are but we're not negative just yet so here's what we'll do I'll go ahead and I grab all of this just to make our job much faster place it in here and we'll decide do we need everything okay no we don't need terminal velocity I still want air velocity so that's good that is still good I still want to reduce my vertical velocity of frame. Um, we don't need to clamp it. And if we are grounded, actually, I don't want to check if I'm grounded. Actually, I, I never want to go from jumping to grounded. I want to go from jumping to falling. So let's do something like that. If my vertical velocity goes beneath zero or it's equal to zero, then we can enter a falling state. Actually, let's just leave that on smaller, like this. Yep. Uh, get component falling. Oops. I put one more two parentheses. And is that going to do anything? <laughs> well, let's have a look. Is that going to do anything? Um, we're going from jumping to falling. That's that's doable. However, how do we get inside of jumping? How do we access the jumping state? We can do it when we're on the floor. Okay. So which state considers us as being on the floor? In this case, walking. Cool, cool, cool. So, if we're over here, it's because we're grounded, right? If we were not grounded, we'd be under falling state anyway. So, let's do something like this. If we are grounded, which we are, and we're pressing on key code spacebar, so if we're pressing on spacebar, we are going to swap over to a jumping state. So, let's do motor change state sorry about the uh, the factoring I'll do that in a second state jumping like so and here we go 
Cool, cool, cool. So is that going to work? We're walking right now, we're pressing on spacebar, and then we're entering jumping state. That's not enough. Unfortunately, that's not going to be enough. Why? Because jumping state is just a copy of falling. We're not going up. We're never setting that initial value. So what do we do? We could go down here and say, hey, um, you know, uh, well, while you do that, just go ahead and please, you know, make your vertical velocity, I don't know, like 50 or something like that to go very, very far up. Uh, but that's not a clean way to do it. Instead, we made ourselves some checkpoints of code we can call. So under jumping, I'm actually going to jumping and I'll say, hey, when we enter this jumping state, let's go ahead and set our vertical velocity. So motor vertical velocity is going to be equal to say, hey, 14. 14 sounds like a nice number or seven, I think. Getting my number confused. Uh, but even there, it's like, hey, you I mean, at the same time, you have scopes specific for that state so you could say jump force and you can say it over here and you don't have to pollute any other script it can be very specific to this jumping state which means as i go in my inspector and i want to modify something i want to mo modify something about the jump and i'm a designer and we have a very very complicated script here that has a lot of value imagine this has like 20 values i have to find the jump force um, and I don't know what else is going to be affecting. So no, I don't want to do that. Instead, I can go directly under my jumping state and say, hey, let's just, I want to go under jumping, let's just up the jump force and just make this no, 10. And then when I'm done, close this off. I know I haven't messed up with any of my other state. I've just changed my jump and nothing else. Let's give this a try. As I'm going around, I'm under the walking state. Now under the falling state, walking again, falling again, and the famous space bar. Whoa, okay, so what happened right here? A lot more complex than it looks like. Why? Well, because we went from jumping, and then at the peak of our jump, we then enter a falling state, which is going to be very, very useful later when we start plugging in some animation in this thing. But we've got a total of three states over here happening, walking, jumping, falling. And I can prove that to you by saying, hey, during the falling state, let's make our player go very, very fast. So I'll just boost up my air velocity to 30. So what I'll do, I'll hold my A key to go left and I'll press on space bar and you'll see the difference in between jumping and as soon as we enter falling, we'll go so fast. There you go. You now have the proof that we just swap states and the behavior change directly there on the fly. Okay, so we've done it. We've implemented exactly what we had to implement to have the same exact thing as uh, we had previously in state one. A single script versus five different scripts. So that, are, that is our single script. Can't really bash anything more in there without it being very, very spaghetti-like and very, very complicated. But now over here, we have a much more complicated script. The brain is, like to be honest, the brain is more complex, but at the same time, Walking is now isolated, falling isolated, jumping isolated, and if we have a flying state, also could be isolated. So we could just go ahead and create one just for fun. We can say state ghost mode while you're just debugging your game and you're just trying to make things, uh, you know, you're just trying to create yourself a cheat. So you're playing your, your platformer, if it's a little bit too hard, you can go in flying mode just for this, right? So let's let's improvise a little bit. We're trying to create ourselves a ghost mode. Um, we can say public override construct, actually not construct, process motion. That takes in a vector three input. We can have over here private float fly speed could be equal to five. Serialize that field so we can modify it directly within the inspector and we're gonna say okay, so input dot x is gonna be equal to fly speed Actually, it's gonna be times equal to fly speed again And we can do the same exact thing with the velocity over here. So motor dot vertical velocity is gonna be equal to actually hmm, Can we do that here? Yeah, it's gonna be equal to input dot y times fly speed so now I can move in all the axes and I won't be affected by gravity. That's my goal over here. So I have something I can cheat with.
Okay, so what's my issue here? Oh, I have to return to Vector 3. Of course. Do we need anything more? Well, we need a transition, so how do we get in here and how do we get out? So that's also very important. Let's do transition. If we press on the spacebar, actually, if input get key down and we do key code escape, that's going to be a very hard key to reach, but it's, it's ghost mode, right? So it's the cheating mode. Um, and then in that case, we can say, hey, let's just go back to, let's just go back to a walking state. So get component type of state walking. All right, we can do exactly the same in whichever state we want. So how do we get into ghost mode, you say? Well, it's complicated. So where do we want to get into ghost mode from, right? We could get into ghost mode from walking. So only when we're not doing anything, only when we're not walking, only when we're not falling, only when we're not jumping, we can get into ghost mode. Uh, but I want it to be global to everybody. I'd actually like to do that change, like make sure it's global to everybody. Well, I always have the option to go under the base state and say, okay, so if I press on escape from any, any state, I want this to go and do ghost mode. The only problem here is that we're overriding transition every time. So it means that if we are to do something like this that has all the global state, we would also be calling base.transition in that case. Oops. In all our things. And I actually recommend you do that because you'll want to have some states that can be triggered at any time. Um, and then we'll also see a little bit later on during phase three how a outside object can be changing your state. So assuming you're walking around and you want to jump on top of a boost, like there's like going to be a boost and that boost should propel you in the air. Well, that boost item can give you its state, can give you its super jump state or something of the sort. Okay, so enough talking. I've put base transition everywhere except ghost mode. Um, the only reason is that I don't need to have that in ghost mode. Ghost mode is going to be something separate for cheating, right? And over here, I make sure that if I'm in any state, at any time if I press on escape, we enter ghost mode. So let's go ahead and put that on our player. That's like a random addition that I've just did, by the way. So it's not part of the source code, but it's a very simple way to explain that uh, we have this now. So as I go around, I press on escape. Now we enter ghost mode and we can up the flying speed. So 50, for example, and if I'm playing around and I'm missing a jump, so I want to jump here. Oh, I can't do it or I fall. Oh, I'm just cheating now. Then I go back, press escape again. And what happens when I press escape from ghost mode is that I enter a walking state, but walking state then realize that, hey, there's no floor. So it goes under falling state right away, which is quite funny. Uh, let's up our, well, like our speed. I don't like our speed, it's too slow. We're gonna up this speed as well. There, there it is, and maybe 15 here. And we're able to, uh, to do all these modifications directly from the inspector, which is great. Okay, seems a little bit better now. All right, so hopefully you understood the little way we're actually working with the state machine, how scalable this can be, how good this can be if you have different states. What I'd like to do next is I'd like to enter the phase three in which we're gonna plug in our animation state machine. We're gonna create ourselves some animation and we're gonna make sure that this looks good and this looks fine. Okay, so the way I'm gonna go around and do this is that we are going to need a player. And that player is going to need animations. So we'll have to create those animations, which is what I will do directly right here. I'll create myself a folder for animation. On which object should I put my animator actually? I want to be putting my animator on my graphics, so on the actual sprite itself, because it might change and it might use a different animator for everybody. So I went ahead, added myself um, a new animator. Then I'll need myself an animator controller, which should be down here. And I'll call this one player animator. Drag and drop this down here. Now what's going to happen is I'm going to create myself, um, I don't want to create myself state in here directly just yet. Instead, I'd like to create myself animations 
uh, from here and they will be imported directly in the controller. So as I have my object over here, it's just an empty object, has nothing within it, has no animation. Let's remember that over here, our sprites are actually split. So this could be my idle animation. I don't actually know if it's moving. I doubt it's moving actually. I don't know if this is gonna be a good idle animation. Just to make sure, I'll use a blink animation in which the player should blink. Yep, so we see it down here. So I'll go ahead, um, do the exact same thing as we've done previously which is turn that into multiple sprites, open up the sprite editor, slice it automatically, hit apply, and now all of these should now be different sprites. Yep, so they are. And now this is gonna be my animation. It's just a blinking animation, it's nothing too fancy. But this could be my idol. So, I will hit create. I'll say this is my player, underscore idol, go ahead and change that so um, where can we start we're gonna start by changing this very specific sprite renderer and we'll say hey it's gonna be this one instead this should give us a keyframe with that one keyframe in place I can now grab all the rest and just place them next to it like so we're gonna end up having an animation that uh, looks like this very simple animation that is our player idol let's create one for walking around or jumping actually both right so i go under run make this a multiple open the sprite editor i want to slice this automatically apply that's good we got all of them create ourselves a new clip this is uh, this is run i believe yep and i'll do the exact same thing so i'll make sure to replace the first one as i'm recording and then i'll take all of the rest and drag and drop right next to it. Would you look at that? He's going extremely fast. He's a very fast boy. Awesome. And finally jump. You realize that this one has only two jump frames and one of them could actually be falling and not jump. So here's what we'll do. Um, we'll put that on multiple once more. We'll split it. Make sure we slice it automatically. Hit apply. Yep, yep. And now we have two different animations. One of them is going to be for jumping, and the other one is going to be for falling. They can have different animation, and that's totally fine. Because if we have a very, very, very long jump, something that, like a super jump, that lasts for a long time, we don't want it to go into like the falling animation while it's going up. So we can't just base ourselves on a certain timing. So player, jump. And for jump, one frame only, and it's going to be that one where he's just like, hey, with the arms in the air. Awesome. Oh, and why is that? Oh, wait, I just changed player idle. That's bad. My bad. So jump. And we are changing this one. Oh, it seems to not work right now. Let me just... There we go. So that's jumping. And then player underscore falling, or just fall. Same thing, but this time we use the other one and then we end up having four different animations and they will all be in here nice so now at this point what do we do we have to find our logic how are we going to transition in between each other uh, luckily it's quite simple in this case when we enter the game we go under idle when we're idle when we're not moving we have the opportunity to go running and when we're no longer running we have the opportunity to go back to idle very very simple then at any time, if I decide to jump, I can just say so. And then at any time, if I'm entering falling state, I can just say so. And from that point, we can say, hey, okay, so you're entering jumping state. When jumping is over, so when, when say, you're hitting the floor, then you can go under idle. And then if you're running, then it's just going to automatically go to run. So we can use something like that. I think that's a decent way to look at our state machine. I think there's other way as well it's going to be really up to you. So to configure this, we're going to need a couple of parameters. First one is going to be, is grounded. Am I on the floor, right? If I'm on the floor, then a couple of things happens. So over here, if I'm on the floor, from a falling or, or from jumping, actually this one I don't like. Yeah, <laughs> never mind this one. Uh, if I'm jumping, velocity goes down. Mm hmm. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't like that one. I'll put it here anyway, in case it happens, but I really doubt that. Actually, let's just not put it at all. So what's going to happen is that jumping is going to go to falling um, through another trigger. Okay, but if we're falling and eventually we hit the floor, we can say, hey, is grounded is equal to true? Yep. Okay, transition right away. Now, one thing that you'll notice is that if you don't uncheck has exit time, um, it will mean that if you're falling, it's going to keep playing that animation until it's done and then it's going to transition. You want it to transition immediately and by that, you'll have to remove has exit time and I'll do it here as well. So if we're going from idle to running, I don't want my player to finish its idle animation, its blinking animation before it goes to running. I just want it to go right now. So that's why I remove has exit time on both of them. Okay, so if we're grounded, we do that. Now, we're also going to have another value. We can give ourselves the speed value. We can do that directly from the motor. And if we're idle and our speed is bigger than zero, then let's go ahead and run. However, if we're running and our speed is beneath, say, 0 0.1, or 1 for that matter, then let's go back to idle, or 0 0.5. Okay, so we've got entrance to this state, we've got entrance to that state. The only one we don't have to is falling and jumping, and these one will be controlled with trigger. So I could say fall, and I can say jump. Good. Mm, so everything's completed actually. So all we have to do at this point is make sure this stick machine runs by changing this parameter directly within our motor code. How do we do that? Very simple. We go under motor, um, some of them are going to be shared, right? So our speed could be shared, could be reused somewhere else, could be reused for horse animation, could be reused for uh, how tilted you should be if you're going that fast and so on. And also is grounded is going to be shared around all over the place. So what we can do is we can sneak ourselves around here and say, hey, we're going to have an animator on top of this as well. So I'll call this one anim. And I'll say, okay, so anim, if it exists, we're going to say set, let's do set boolean for is grounded to the value we had earlier, this one. Now, did I put a capital letter to is grounded? Let's see. Yes, I have. Okay, awesome. We can also do set float for our speed and what could be our speed our speed in that case could be the move delta dot x so that's how far how fast we're moving on the x-axis and that's done be after the move basically so we know that it's the right value um, I don't want to put my vertical velocity in there so I just put x like it's not doesn't matter how fast I'm falling or how fast I'm going up in the air I just want left and right for that value so now what we've done is that we just assign assign some value to our animation state machine so it can take care of its own logic. And do know that actually Mechanim, the thing you saw earlier, is the best example I could have gave you of a state machine starting. This is a state machine. It acts on its own all the time and then you have a transition the transition thing that checks, okay, should we change right now? No? Okay, let's go ahead and keep on doing this. Uh, this is like a very good example of a stick machine, actually. Okay, now what else do we need? We need to have triggers for falling and jumping. Fall and jump. These can be called at this moment. We can say, hey, motor, animation, so anim in this case, which is not public. Let's go ahead and make it public so we can access it in this case. set trigger and which one is this this is jumping let's call it jump oh and also i'd like to put the uh question mark sign here to see if it's not null before i do so same thing for falling falling doesn't have a construct state we're going to give it one so public override construct fall and just like this we hooked in our state machine animation state machine on top of our player. So let's have a look at that. What's going on? We have an error. 
the variable has not been assigned. Okay, that's totally fine. It's because it doesn't exist, which kind of... Hmm. It's kind of not good. It doesn't exist right now because it's beneath, actually. It's beneath our character. It's under graphics. So one of the way we could go about doing this is say, okay, so we're going to find our animator, so anim, is equal to get component in children, which will get the first one it finds in this case, the graphics one. And now we'll have this as value. Awesome. Let's hit play. Oh, and we're getting a couple of issues over here. So what are the issues? First, we're not when we're going left, nothing happens. When we're going right, something happens, just a little bit slow. As we're jumping, it doesn't seem like we're entering the state machine. So let's see. Hmm, so both of these are triggered. So fall and jump are triggered. We can see it on the left hand side over here. But they're not entering any states and that's because I actually forgot to put conditions over here on these. So if we're entering fall, condition has to be fall trigger. If we're entering jump, condition is jump trigger. That will fix one of our problem, which is no fall and jump animation. So now we have these. As I'm entering falling, like I don't even have to go through, I don't even have to go through um, jumping state. I can just straight up fall, and it's gonna do this. That's perfect. But I can also jump, and then have falling enter right after. Now our problem over here is that our animation starts a little bit like too slow and also we're still not going right or left properly. We're not playing our run animation where we're going left. Um, so we still have a couple of issues. Which one should we fix first? I want to fix the <laughs> the running animation not going, uh, not playing when we're going left. It's a very simple fix. Actually over here I said hey we should be moving using move delta.x was a bad um, decision because we might be moving towards the left side in which case instead of going, say, plus 5 towards the right, we might be going minus 5, but we're still moving at a speed of 5. So what's important here is to do absolute. We're taking the actual speed value, how fast you're going, and not what direction you're going in. And just like this, we will have fixed our first problem, which was, hey, we can't go left. Uh, we can't play animation if we go left. Alright, so animation does play when we go left, however, we're still facing right, so that's another problem. Um, now what I'd like to fix is how reactive those animations are. So as you can see, there's a good delay in between them, and that's actually the transition delay, and we don't want that whatsoever. So I'll leave this running, and I'll put my animator in full screen. And what we'll do is we'll go over every single one of these, and we'll make sure to reduce the time for those transitions, just by taking this slider, putting it all the way say over there so now when we go from run to idle it's going to be very sharp very fast and when we go from idle to run it's also going to be very very fast when i go from falling to idle very very fast when i go from whatever to falling should be fast and jumping should be fast as well these changes i actually <clears throat> sorry these changes i can do them within play mode and they're gonna stick. So let's play this. Okay, so it's much more reactive now. So the animation starts playing right away. And as I jump, there we go. It's a lot more fun to play. It's a lot more reactive. Only problem is that we're doing moonwalk, which actually looks very, very cool. Um, but there is one thing our state machine doesn't do actually. And um, if you have a peek at my other state machine, the one you'll see in the description down below, second link, uh, I do something more than just process motion. Sometimes you want to be doing something a little bit more. So what I have in a more advanced state machine, a more advanced um, state machine based off this, is instead of process motion, is I have process motion, but also process rotation, in which I get the quaternion, and depending on my state, my state also decides how and where I should be looking at and where I should be facing. As we're doing a 2D game, it's very simple to just go around and say, hey, you know what, our graphic that is on top of our state machine, we can just say transform that local scale and say it's gonna be equal to one of the two things depending on which direction we go. If we are going towards the left side, so if move delta.x is says, oops, sorry about that, 
If it's smaller than zero, it means we're going towards the left. And that means my scale should be, what does my scale should be? It should be new vector three minus one, one, one. And if we're going towards the right, it should be one, 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 or vector three dot one. That could technically work, but I also want to ensure that um, if I'm not moving at all, I don't lose my position. So I'm just going to say, if move delta is not equal to zero, if we have a value in one of these directions, so if we have a value that's minus one or a value that's one, uh, only then I will change. If I'm not moving whatsoever, I don't want to be changing my direction. So let's try this one out, see if it works. That could be acting as our process rotation in this case. There we go. That's all we needed. That's actually all we needed to make this work. Let's follow our guy around, right? Let's just put this camera on top of him. Let's have a good look at what he's doing. What's good with this boy? So I'm running around. I can jump. I can fall. And everything is extremely reactive. We have states for everything. If we want to cheat, we can just press on escape and then we're not playing any animation over here, which is also very fun to look at, <laughs> but we can now cheat and uh, just go to the proper place, hit escape again, then we're back on duty, which is totally good. And that's just how we've made ourselves a state machine. Ugh. All right, guys, it's been quite a ride. It's been quite a heavy session on coding. Um, we could go ahead and create a lot more states. We just added our animation. We could go ahead and make the dashing dashing state. We could do that. But pretty much the whole concept of the same machine, I hope you understood it. It's pretty much complete. Now at this point, it's a matter of you. What do you want to be doing with this? You want to create yourself a horse, a riding horse mechanic, a riding horse uh, state? You can do pretty much whatever you want. Oh, I said I was going to show one thing. Um, so you have a state that's coming from outside, something that's very specific to one level and that you won't be using anywhere else or something that you will be using in a lot of different places, but you'd like that to, um, you'd like that to stay here, like to be processed by your motor. Um, you have also the option to create objects from the outside. Like at this point, everything is open. You have objects from the outside that could be colliding with your player. From that point on, once it's colliding, you could say, hey, you're colliding with player motor, grab player motor and call the change state function on it. That can, uh, that can also be something possible. So to give you a very quick, very quick and dirty example, I'll do state super jumping or jump pad. I'll take my previous jumping Um, so let's go under jumping state. Yep, this one. I'll copy the whole thing, change the name of the state. So jump pad. It's still a base state. Um, air velocity maybe could be the same, but the jump force is going to be something crazy, like 20. Um, still want to set my animation, still want to set my vertical velocity. This is all fine. Actually, I don't need to change anything here. I don't believe that I need to change anything here. And that could be it. So I just have a brand new state that just have a different value in this case. It's nothing big, but uh, you could also control that from somewhere else. I'm just giving, giving a quick, very dirty example. Oh. Um, and then this jump pad would be a 3D object within the space. So it could be, say, over here. It's going to be a little bit hard to attain. Oops, sorry about that. Let's go into 2D mode and move this one around. If you jump on this thing over here, it's gonna push you in the air very, very high. It's gonna be say is trigger, and we can create a script just for that. So jump pad. Put that on his trigger, right? Yeah, I did. Okay. So as we collide with the player, we can do something like that. So private void on trigger enter if the collider so if other but get component type of player motor if we get the player motor through collision 
I don't know if that's gonna work or that's gonna give me a crash. Um, let's do this instead. If motor is not equal to null, so if we got the player or we got any any object that has the player motor on it, we can say motor dot change state. We're changing state for motor dot get component jump pad. And you're going to realize here that I'm getting a reference to motor, but we could also put the state directly on the jump pad. So if it's something that you'll be disposing after this level, if there is no more jump pad anywhere else in the game, maybe it's not a state you want to be carrying around on your, um, your character controller, your player motor. So maybe you just want to leave it right here on the jump pad instead. And that's something very, very doable. It's something that you could actually do. And there's no problem doing that. Um, but in this case, I left it on here. So I can say state jump pad like so. And now an external object is actually changing my state. Let's give this a try. So I'm going to pull the camera a little bit further back. And hopefully this works because I'm, I'm actually improvising on the fly right here to, just to give you um, a little bit more examples. So as I go over here, this is my normal jump. It's really not too high. This is when I enter the jump pad. Oh, it goes a little bit higher, but it's not fast enough. So let's go and change that. Um, let's go, well, see, because my state is not on my jump pad right here, I have to go over here and change it. So maybe 30 in this case. There we go. We're now properly reset. Amazing. So you'll find that in the source code of this video and the source code that you find below um, on GitLab, you will find a dashing state instead. It's just a simple, very simple dash. In fact, that's what I've shown you very early on over here. We didn't have the jump pad. We didn't have the ghost mode. You see how easy and fast it can be to create new states. So I hope that you guys got the best out of this. I hope you understood a little bit of what's going on. And I recommend that you do have a look at those links in the description down below. You implement the state machine. It's something that, something that I really enjoy, something that I've been working on for quite a while. And, um, it's a solution that has always been working very well for me, either for 2D game, 3D game, every time I need to move something, or I also use it before state, before a Snip Machine existed, I've used it and it was quite good to change my cameras around and changing how my main camera would behave. Um, Sometimes it would have a state for being on the rail, Sometimes it would have a state for following the player around in third person, Sometimes it would go in top down. This was a state machine as well. So state machine can be applied to way more than just your character controller. I just think it's a really good way to get started. If you want to move stuff around, you'll see a very physical and very graphical way to do it. Um, you, you'll see some changes right on the screen and that's always very, very good. So to end this webinar, to end this session, first, I'm sorry the internet was not that good. Hopefully the quality of the VOD will not be affected. Um, I'll just show you real quick an example of a more complex 3D state machine based off exactly the same concept we've seen today. And the state machine I'll be showing you is the second link in the description. So this one is also public and I'm working on it left and right, just in trying to improve things. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's as simple as that. So it's gonna take a little bit of time to open. Actually, it's going to take a lot of time to open. The project is not that big, it's just that when my computer is um, is recording and streaming at the same time, I just have so much issues doing anything. It's a very old computer.
while I'm at it, I'm actually going to show you a little bit of uh, this project in GitLab. Just some really quick walkthrough. Again, if, <laughs> if things can unlock and get started, that'd be good. There we go. We'll get a browser running. That's a start. So as mentioned, second link in the description down below. It is a state machine. It's actually a full Unity project. I recommend that you get it directly from GitLab. Um, the reason being is we have a couple of different packages in here. It's using the lightweight rendering pipeline, it's using the new input system, and it's using also Cinemachine. And if we dig a little bit into it, and I'll show you in a second when it opens within Unity, we have the script folder, and inside of here, this motor folder is actually exactly what we've been doing today. That's very interesting. And inside of here, we'll find a couple of states. Actually, we found the, um, <clears throat> we found the player motor, we found motor helper, which I'll actually explain to you really quick, and also a base motor. So I go a little bit further in this example because I have a base motor, and then on top of that, I have a player motor. So player motor inherits from base. The reason I've done that is because sometime this state machine that you've created, maybe you don't want it for your player. Maybe you want it for a, a boss or an AI. So you could have a base motor for every type of object, and then under my player motor, I override for player specific stuff, such as inputs. Inputs are only there for the player, they're not there for the AI. AI has another kind of input, something that he computes himself. So by splitting it like that, I have a I have a chance right here to split this base motor into say AI motor or like bus motor or something like that. And under my state, I don't have much right now, I only have falling, jumping, walking, just like we saw earlier. But I'm actually working on the flying one um, very, very soon. It should be released. So if you want to just subscribe to that GitHub, GitLab, you can also have the, you have that option as well. So what do we have over here? It's exactly the same project I was talking about. This one is using the new input system, but it's in 3D this time. And you'll find it much more complex for the simple reason that now we're doing 3D maths. And 3D maths is, uh, they require a little bit of a different way to tackle things. But it's as simple as the other one. There's the same logic behind it. We just have a little bit more that goes within the 3D environment, such as uh, you need to follow the floor in all the direction. If you're running into a wall, you have to kill that velocity with the wall so your player doesn't get stuck in it. You want to be doing a couple of uh, quaternions for the rotation of your player. It's, it's a whole different thing. So I really encourage you guys to have a look at that down there. And with this, I will actually conclude the session. We've been a little bit over one hour and 45 minutes, I believe, or one hour and 30 minutes. Um, really enjoyed doing this session. I hope you guys enjoyed as well. On behalf of the Unity Indian team, I wish you a very rest, very good rest of your day. And if you need to watch this again, maybe in slower or maybe a little bit faster, you can do so directly on YouTube and change the speed settings. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any question, we will stay in the chat and answer that. And yeah, hope you guys have a good day. Cheers.